this week I was, guys, I don't know if you can relate. I think you can. Maybe you won't admit it. Uh, ladies, I'll give you a, a little glimpse into manhood. We like to flirt with death. Or at least we like to say we like to flirt with death. When reality is, it probably scares us. Um, but this week I flirted with death. And I was quite proud of it. What happened was I was, uh, I was sitting on my couch. I was on the phone with someone or something. Yes, it's dangerous on my couch. I'll tell you what. I'm sitting there and I'm feeling like, you know, something dribble out of my nose. And I'm just like, well, I don't got allergies or anything. So I do what every man would do. Just because my wife is sleeping, I can do whatever I want. And, uh, and I leave a long streak of blood down my arm. And I'm like, I never get nosebleeds. And the first thing that pops in my mind is the scene from a movie that I saw and I have no idea what it's called outside of this scene or the movie was about a, a, a kid who had a bloody nose throughout life and he eventually died from a bloody nose. So I wiped my nose on my hand, blood all down my arm, and I said, I'm going to die. This is it. This is how I'm going to go. This is my thought process. Uh, my first thought is, all right, milk it for what it's worth. Beck is sleeping. So I get my paper towel, and I'm just like, you know, just blood's getting everywhere. I'm like, I, I look I look pretty much like that. So I go into the room, and Beck is laying there and fast asleep and trying to be courteous of the fact that she's sleeping, but I want my wife to know I may be dead soon. So I tap her on the knee. Becca, Becca, you sleeping? And sure enough, she is. Becca, 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 my nose is bleeding. I might be dying. And, like, it's just those words that just, bing! And she looks up, and there's just blood on me and stuff. I don't know what's going on. It just started bleeding. I, I don't know. My mind thinking, like, I got I got brain tumors that are causing blood. blood. It's it. It's the end of the war. It's the end of the line. And I'm kind of like, you know, like, I'm macho, man. And, guys, it's a nosebleed. I, I don't know where it came from, but it just, a few drops of blood, and it looks like, you know, you've been stabbed a few times. And uh, sure enough, it just it dried up. But regardless, then life settles down, and I start to think about death. And maybe if you're like me, it does kind of, like, scare you, right? Maybe not like after death, because as a Christian, maybe you're just fully convinced that there is heaven, God exists, that you're going to be in his presence. But maybe what scares you is the process of death, right? How will this happen? And what, what's going to go on through? And, and so some, some of you may just not entertain the idea, because it just causes emotions you don't want to go through. Uh, or, or, if we can be really honest, maybe you do ask the question, what if God isn't real? What if there isn't a heaven? What if the Bible's just made up? And that's it. The end of the road. Maybe that's really kind of the root of the fear. I put my life into this. Oh, please, be true. I hope to bring some some hope to you. As we, as you maybe as some of you just think about. It. I mean, it doesn't matter what age you're at, right? I mean, the, the thought of death crosses our mind at some point in life, and for some of us. You may, it may just cling to you like a tumor and just drain the life and the joy out of it. So, one of the things that I just, I, what am I going to corral around today? I think it's this phrase, as I live, says the Lord, that we see in Romans 14. If you want to open up to Romans 14 again, let me read to you. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Let me, let me give you the overall picture if you've missed a few weeks. We're talking, we've been in Romans 14, Paul's talking to the weaker brother. He's weak in what? In his faith. Paul's not judging him or despising him. He's pointing out the fact that there's people in church, there are Christians who have a weaker faith than other Christians. And that weakness is revealed in the fact that they do more. They adhere to the law a little bit more to supplement their faith. They feel as if 
They're a better Christian. God's more pleased with them if they do X, Y, and Z. And he's talking to those who are strong, even though he never uses that word in their faith. They're more mature that their faith gives them a freedom to do to do certain things in life. That they found a, uh, Christian liberty in their faith. So this is what Paul's talking about. He says, why do you pass judgment? We're talking about the weaker brother. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. So Paul tur- turns his attention. The first, the first uh, ten verses, he's primarily talking to the weaker one because the, the, uh, the temptation for the weaker brother is this, is to say, look at what I'm doing. Right? I'm, at, I'm obeying God better, better than you, and therefore the temptation is to judge people, to judge other Christians and say, You're, how, how can you be a Christian and drink alcohol? Or how can you be a Christian and what he's talking about and eat those foods? How can you be a Christian and go play soccer on the Sabbath? He says, so, and then he turns his attention also to the strong. He says, hey, and by the way, your temptation is to despise your weaker brother. Look down on them. Because they're so, they're so maybe strict. Or, uh, you know, they're, maybe they're stiff in life. And so he's, he's talks to both of them now. He converges and he talks to both of them. He says, why? Why do you do this? For we will stand before the judgment seat of God. This idea of judgment seat we see in Paul's writings a few times. It's literally, uh, in the Roman culture, they had a tribunal bench that you would walk into, into uh, I don't know, the courts or whatever, and the judge would sit on this bench where he would do his judgment. Paul says, all of us will stand before God at one point, before Jesus, and Jesus will act as our judge. Now, this becomes this becomes kind of muddy theology, right? Because maybe you have a, a connotation of this word judge that you say, well, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to be judged, right? And, and partly that's right in the fact that Jesus Christ has taken the punishment for my sin. And if you believe, as Ryan said, if you believe in him, he's taken the punishment for your sin. You will not be judged overall as a non-believer, as a uh, as a sinner, but will be judged according to the righteousness, the following, the perfection of Jesus. The Father will say, your name is written in the book of life, not because of anything you've done, but I'm judging you based upon what my son has done, who has done nothing evil. Okay? But yet, he says this, he said, but we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So what is this judgment seat? I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. If you want to turn there. 2 Corinthians 5.10. He talks about this a little bit more. The same idea uh, about the judgment seat. But he expounds it a little bit more about what, what will we be doing at this, uh, in front of this judgment seat. What will we be judged for? Verse 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of God. There's this word all again. All. We've seen it twice. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And Paul begins, we begin to see him peeling back the layers of what will this judgment look like. For each one will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we will all stand before Jesus one day, and uh, and He will He will give to us accordingly to what we have done. But still a little bit muddy to me. I mean, what is what is He talking about? I mean, what is I want to I really want to understand what this is because guys, this will drive your Christianity. If you've got a warped view of how God is going to judge you, you will you will live a warped life as a Christian. You will. There's the uh, possibility that you will think that the, that Jesus or God the Father will always be mad at you because you can never do enough. And so therefore, you're going to always try harder so that one day he'll look at you and say, ah, you did perfect. But even to this day right now, 
if you're a child of God, the Father is pleased with you because of your faith, not because of anything you've done, but because you believe in him. Does that mean we have we give no account for the things we do today? Do the things we do today have any eternal effect on us? And they do. They do. Verse 11, back to Romans 14. Verse 11, for it is written, he goes to Isaiah, as I live, underline that, or make, make a mental note, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. As I live, says the Lord. A couple things. I want to not just know, I want to hammer on. We see these words, all, every. Guys, they're, this is a, this is a prophecy about you. One day, you will bow your knee to God to Jesus. One day you will bow your knee to Jesus. One day your lips will utter that God was God alone. It it won't, and it won't be Jesus is forcing you, bow, bow to me. You must confess it. You know, it will be a, just a gut reaction as you enter into his presence. Think of this, Joseph. Remember Joseph back in Genesis 41-ish? He has a dream about his brothers. And that dream, what was it? It was about his brothers bowing down to him. And the brothers laughed at him. They said, no, this will never happen. He has another dream. They bow down to him. Never happened. Never happened. Well, sure enough, one day, through God's sovereign hand, Joseph ends up in Egypt, one of the top rulers in Egypt, and sure enough, his brothers end up in his presence, and without even thinking about it, they bow to him. I think this is what it's going to be like. It's not, we're going to be, we're going to be in God's presence one day, and this won't cross our mind. It will be the fact that you're standing in the very presence of God, that your knee will hit the ground. Your knee will hit the ground one day. Don't mark my words on it. Mark God's words on it. Every one of us, every one of us, our lips will not be able to stop uttering the praises of God. It will happen. It will happen. And what is, okay, all right, great, sure, it will happen. Prove it to me. Prove how, you say it will happen. Paul uses this phrase as his back, as his backbone, as his, uh, this is, this is where I was getting stuck earlier in my preparation. Um, Paul says, here, I'm going to prove it to you. He says, as the Lord lives, this will happen. Paul could have said, as, or, or God could have said to Isaiah, as surely as you're reading these words on the page, on the paper, on the pages, or as surely as you're hearing them from Isaiah's lips, this will happen. But God points to something that's even more certain than that. The fact that he's alive. This, this kind of blows my mind because I, I could say as surely as you're sitting here today, you will bow your knee to God. Right? I could say that. As surely as you're breathing, as surely as you are here in this building, your knee will bow. But there is something more certain than that. And that is God is alive. God uses his own living presence to say, as certain as I am alive, this will happen. So more certain. You're, you're absolutely sure, guys, you're here right now? More certain than that, God is alive. More certain than that, your Christianity, your faith in him has purpose. Don't we live in a culture today that says, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if there's a God. I, I, mean, I don't know what to believe. Well, God, God uses his own life as, as saying, man, bet on that. Bet on that. The fact that I'm alive, guys, and if you're struggling with the idea of death, and you say, well, I don't know. I've gone through those phases, and I probably will continue. And I, and I, was, I was thinking about this. I said, like, can I even say this? I don't know. I'm human. Doubt. God, I hope man, I put everything into this. Those, those words come out of my mouth sometimes. The, those thoughts flow through my head. 
And God tells me and he tells you this morning, hey, I am alive. I was as alive 2,600 years ago when I spoke to Isaiah as I was 2,000 years ago when Paul put his pen to the paper as I am today as I was 4,000 years ago when I told Moses in the burning bush, I am who I am. This is present, present tense. As I live, you're God. Jesus Christ, who we're, we're celebrating his arrival here in the ne- over the next few weeks. There's, there's no doubt in that. That happened. And he is alive and well, sitting at the right hand of his Father. Those both, you may, you may think because of circumstances in your life that God has pulled back or that he's not alive, or he doesn't care. But in his sovereign grace, he is alive and well, so you can bet on it. You will see me one day. Seventy years ain't that long. It's coming soon. It's coming soon. This is a prophecy about you. It's kind of weird to put it that way, but as I think about it, I, I mean, Paul is saying, Isaiah was saying, this is about me. My knee will go to the ground one day. It will happen. Yours will too. Yours will too. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm walking through Best Buy on Black, on Black Friday. And the thoughts are coming through my head as I'm standing there just looking at the people. And we live in a relatively calm area of the nation when it comes to Black Friday. I mean, you're just uh, reading about the guys who stabbing each other with parking spots and stuff. And, Is this pagan worship when we're killing each other over TVs, over parking spots to get to the TV? Is Best Buy the new Athens? Just all the different idols on the shelves as we walk through and pick which ones we want that's worth our our money and our time? It's 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 not to knock on Best Buy or to knock on us shopping and giving gifts over Christmas, but it's it's how pervasive our worship is becoming for things that are just blinded. They have no eternal value. None whatsoever. As I live, as I live, says the Lord. Philippians 2. Paul reiterates this to the, to the Philippians. Philippians 2, verse 10 and verse 11. And Paul brings this up, this idea up, now three times in his letters. So that the, the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. I just To the glory of God the Father, I picture, I picture it like this. Just take this as my like mental picturing, not as as biblical. Uh, God the Father, Jesus is on his, his right hand, right side. He's judging the nations. He's judging us. We're giving an account for what we have done. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And to his glory, to the Father's glory, those who were professing as atheists, those who were set against him, everybody who had a knee, believer or non-believer, will, will finally say he was God. And the Father will do, I, I just wonder, will the Father be there in delight in that his son, who was crucified at the hands of sinners, those very sinners will take back the, those words and probably beg for mercy as they confess that they killed the Son of God. I don't know. I mean, but this is this is just huge. It's not just Christians. We're not the only one that we bound. Every single one of us, everybody in this community, everyone that walks down these streets, everyone that goes and does whatever they do at midnight, every single person will bow their knee and confess Jesus 
as Christ. Verse 12, so then each of us, of Romans 14, verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is where it becomes kind of hazy. Okay, this is what, there's there's two judgments that will take place. This is the way I isolate it in my mind. We've got one judgment where, where, the, uh, where Jesus separates the goats from the sheep, right? You're my child. You're not my child. And then we have a second judgment where everybody will give an account for what they've done in this body. Uh, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. If we go back Romans 2, verse 6 through verse 13. This kind of, it brings it out a little bit more. Same book, same person who wrote the book. Romans as a big picture is the, is we, uh, we are justified by faith. Alright, we are children of God, not because of what we do, but because we have faith. Romans 2 now, verse 6 to verse 13. Let me, just forget that. That was great stuff. He will render to, I'm like, this is, he will render to each one. Uh, let me just go straight to verse 13 because that's the good one. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Holy smokes, back up to station wagons. But the doers of the law who will be justified. I thought we were justified by faith. Paul is telling me in Romans 2, not in Romans 6, it wasn't in there, Romans 2, that the doers of the law will be justified. Does that mean to be justified, we must uphold the law? Well, no. I mean, Ephesians 2, written by the same person, inspired by God, says it is by faith that we're saved through grace. Nothing that I've done, so I can't boast. So what is Paul saying? It is the doers of the law that will be justified. Here, picture this. Uh, This entire stage. Picture the entire stage as representing law, okay? My life before God, I lived in this stage area, okay? The, uh, the, the entire stage represented law. So I wander about, and I try to do the law. I try to, uh, I try to be sexually pure. I try not to get drunk. I try not to have any other gods except God, and, and I just do, 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 okay? I try hard to be accepted by God, but then one day, the Holy Spirit revives my heart. He, he comes in. He breathes life in it. I turn to Jesus. I have faith. Now picture this. This wooden platform in the stage represents that Christ has abolished the law, has set me free from the dominion of the law. I can now live free in this area that is wood. I can be myself. But God still says, right? I mean, the sexual, you know, don't be sexually impure. Don't murder. Don't have any other gods except except me. Don't bow down to false images. Don't take my name in vain. There's still law. But God has, in fact, Romans 6, we just read, he has abolished it. He has set us free. It no longer reigns in us. I have, we have the ability to be ourselves, who God has created us to be and live in freedom because God, Jesus Christ, has abolished the law. He has set me free. But what can happen is this. I can walk into the law again. Right? I could, I could go back to the law and say, no, I'm, my, I'm doubting. I need to try harder. Or I can dabble in sin. I could go and steal or be a thief or whatever. Uh, I could struggle with having false gods. But yet, through forgiveness and God's, uh, God's mercy, there is freedom. I can walk right back into that freedom. I, I'm no longer enslaved to the law or the things that hold me back from the law. Here's what I believe this means. Romans, Two, when Paul says the doers of the law will be justified, if you are a child of God, you live here. Here, you don't live in the law. You've been set free. Therefore, you will do the law. Okay, listen to me closely. You will do the law because the one who lives inside of you, Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The one who abolished the law, who fulfilled every letter of the law, now lives in me. I will, I will be a doer of the law. It won't be perfect. 
It's the doers of the law that will be justified. It's the doers of the law. It's, it's, it's my doing of the law, my obedience to God that proves my faith. James 1 says that our faith without works is dead. So, it's not that Romans 14, when we're talking about Christian freedom, that we have the freedom to do whatever we want, and that God will forgive me no matter what. It's the, it's the very fact that you're a child of God, that you live in this area of freedom. And the analogy falls short in so many ways. But it's the fact that I am free to be who I am, and I live here, you live here, that you're going to be a doer of the law, and you will be justified. One more, one more passage. 1 Corinthians 8, uh, no, 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 14. He who plants, I'm going to show you about this right now. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul just called you a garden and a building. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master, builder, I laid a foundation. Paul says, I laid a foundation in you as Corinthians. Same thing I'm kind of doing now, hopefully laying a foundation. What's the foundation? That someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds, builds upon it. Verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. Foundation is the gospel. Now, if anyone, verse 12, builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. You see, the day, capital D, is the judgment day. It will expose what type of work we have built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is where Paul's going with the weaker brother. He says, hey, he says, weaker brother, you who are weak in your faith, it's okay that you're there, but I want you to be somewhere else. I want you to have faith in God so you can build a life upon the foundation in your heart that's not built upon your works and your doings of the law, but is built upon faith. Because one day, like gold, silver, hay, straw, everything you're doing to try to please God that's not done by faith, but it's done out of fear and doubt, it's of no value. You will stand before Jesus one day and say, well, I, did X, I did X, Y, and Z. He said, well, hey, you're still my child, but, but where was the faith? X, Y, and Z, I mean, I, I appreciate it. Listen. Uh, this is this is where part of me went. Wrong, I went wrong, and when I was young, when people did these like, I don't know, little storylines of like Judgment Day and stuff, I ain't been there. So I'm just kind of portraying what I see it as. Uh, but do not develop a theology. I, I will stand in front of Jesus one day, and, and this conversation will take place. I'm just trying to break it down as best as I can for you. That that Jesus says, listen, this stuff that's all worldly the law. I mean, without faith, it means nothing. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And so Jesus says, I will reward you for those things you do in life that were by faith. So there are degrees of punishment that uh, non-believers will receive based upon what they do in this life. There are degrees of rewards that believers will receive based upon what they do in this life. But our judgment, our salvation, our righteousness is not dependent upon what I do. It's dependent upon what Jesus has done. I'm going to let this be and I'm going to pray that God will take this message and work on it in you um, because 
I feel like it's unclear. Um, so here's the point. Here's, here's how I want to wrap up. Uh, if, if I can leave you with anything, it's this. As I live, says the Lord. As I live, says the Lord. You serve a God. You love a God. You follow a God who is alive right now. Right now. And one day you're going to see him. And he's going to hide a smile and say, man, welcome home. Welcome home. I am so glad you're here. Now let's talk about what you did in that life. Let's talk about the good you did, the faith that you had. And then let's go build you a, you know, a house or a mansion. Let's go give you a bunch of crowns depending upon what you, you know, what you did in faith. I mean, that's awesome. But that's not, I don't think that's going to matter to me. I'm going to be standing in the presence of God. I'll be too busy bowing and confessing Him as God. Here's what it tells me, church, is it, uh, is that this, is that we've got a bigger job to do. Uh, let me get real practical just for a minute. We, we talked about the refinance here a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to begin uh, remodeling the nursery and moving the bathrooms and the sanctuary. Um, this, is a, this is a great chance for us as a church to embrace uh, what Paul has been teaching us in Romans 14. It's this idea of not judging and despising. I'm excited about the fact that God has allowed us and given us the finances to put some money into this building. The uh, the catch twenty two on that is is that most of the stuff that will be done is mere man's opinion, no eternal value. We're gonna change carpet, and we are gonna survive as a church. You know why? Because I know we did it, All right? I mean, we may not we may not like the carpet color. I believe we will love the carpet color because I'm not picking it out. We've got people that have to do this for a living to pick it out and pull it all together. We got, we asked a couple people from the outside who know what they're doing to hold our hands through this because of this. With the others, we, we decided we don't. We could, for example, carpet. We could talk about carpet honestly forever, right? Because everybody has an opinion, and your opinion matters. And we would want to hear your opinion, or we simply make the decision and move on because we realize that something as small as carpet color can distract us from the bigger picture of our purpose as a church. And uh, and so, every if, if Paul is right, and he's betting on the fact that God says he's alive, so therefore, I believe he's right, everybody in this community will confess God one day. Jesus is God. I want to see that. Let's have, let's have that happen today, this side of the grave. Right? That's why I don't want to, I don't want to talk about carpet color. Guys, when we, when we paint it in here, it just, it drains us as leaders. When we, when we do sit down and talk about opinions. So as a church, I want us to embrace what are mere man's opinions and things that will burn up in the end. And what are things that are going to last forever? So we want to use this building as best as we can for God's glory. And also on top of that, it's just the tool. Uh, maybe we'll move out in five years. Just, we fill it up and we need to. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. We come into a season where we talk about Jesus Christ coming into this world. The greatest gift that can be given. We have a Christmas Eve service. We're going to do a small outreach project afterwards. Afterwards, very simple um, outreach project. And uh, the gospel message will be preached. I mean, church, let's, let's come together as an army of 60 to get people's need to bow today because of the goodness of God. Get people to confess Jesus as Lord today. And not just take that chance that it won't just happen, but it, the fact that it will happen. It will happen. They will, they will meet God. And a lot of them will beg for mercy. Show them the gospel today. Church, I'm excited about you. I mean, I, I love to see our growth over these past two years. We're still a young church. and But I've seen so much growth just in the uh, 60 of us or so that come here. It's, it's awesome to see that. And I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited to be doing a Christmas Eve service for the first time this year. Uh, if the band, if you want to come up, uh, soul care workers, if you want to, also come up. 
I don't know, kind of the heavy thing that's on my heart right now is the idea of death. Maybe you're struggling with that recently. Maybe that's just kind of flowing and it's got a control over you. You know, soul care workers love to pray with you about that. We've asked them that during this fourth song that they pray with you, then if you have other things you need to pray about, they would take you out into the fellowship hall to continue doing that so we can close out the service. Uh, maybe you want to give thanks to God for something. We're here to pray with you and give thanks with you. Uh, church, I'm truly thankful for you. I'm excited to see what God does. Uh, let, me, let me pray.